Starting off at number 10, we have Adrian Brody. Adrian Brody is a well respected dramatic actor, winning the Oscar in 2002 for the best actor in The Pianist, with him kissing presenter Halle Berry on stage. Then, on the heels of his new fame, he was asked to host SNL in 2003. And when he was introducing the musical guest, Jamaican singer Sean Paul, he not only made everyone cringe with embarrassment, but he also broke one of the golden rules of live TV. For the introduction, Brody took it upon himself to grab a dreadlock wig and ramble in a problematic Jamaican accent for way too long before handing things off. And even though the Jamaican accent was offensive and he probably should have been banned for just that, the bit wasn't planned and he ended up wasting a lot of valuable airtime, which caused the ban. Brody spoke about the ban with the Huffington Post and said that he might be banned, but he never heard anything official about it. In at number 9, Sinead O'Connor. Sinead O'Connor was asked to perform on SNL in 1990, in the peak of her fame, but she ended up bailing when she realized comedian Andrew Dice Clay was going to be hosting. And although it put a wrinkle in things, they were still able to manage. O'Connor finally performed on SNL in October of 1992, but SNL was probably wishing that she didn't, because O'Connor ended the performance by holding up a picture of Pope John Paul the second, ripping it up and stating, quote, fight the real enemy, obviously offending millions of people. The show quickly cut after they saw what happened, but the damage was already done and tons of angry calls came in. One audience member tried to assault O'Connor and had to be removed by security. Unsurprisingly, O'Connor never played SNL again. Wonder why. In at number 8, Kanye West. It's no shock that Kanye's banned. Honestly, I'm shocked he's not banned from everything at this point. Before the band, West appeared on the show seven times and always managed to bring an incredibly thought out performance to the show. West is even held in such high regards that SNL producers allowed him in a rare third performance segment in that particular episode. But they were shocked when instead of playing a song, he made an entire speech praising President Trump while wearing one of his mega hats. NBC cut the speech short for viewers, and the outburst was not received well by the live audience members. Not long after, West claimed on Twitter that SNL producer Lauren Michaels had asked him to return to quote, host before the year is out. But according to Radar Online, Kanye was actually banned instead. And the latter seems a lot more likely to me. In at number 7, David Bowie. In 1997, David Bowie was banned. And from what happened, he totally deserved it. Basically, he was asked to be the musical guest, and he was going to act in a sketch too. But they made a sketch where Bowie would sing parodies of his own songs. Bowie told Post, quote, One of the things they came up with was a version of my song, Watch That Man. But instead in the chorus, I would sing Try Our Flan. Apparently, the writers and Bowie fought over the pronunciation of the word flan, though. Flan? Flan? I could be messing it up right now. And literally during the broadcast, Bowie said he wasn't going to do the skit anymore, and he wanted to change the song he was performing. Instead of performing, quote, telling lies as rehearsed, Bowie played his 1980 track Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. And the reason is really awful. Apparently, Lorne Michaels told Bowie that the song reminded him of a very dark time in his life. And I guess the reason Bowie played it was out of spite. Apparently, as soon as the song was over, Bowie claimed he was escorted from the building and banned from SNL. However, in late 1999, he was back as a musical guest after apparently smoothing things over with Michaels, saying, quote, we're mates. He knows now that I was just trying to get a rise out of him. And at number six, Martin Lawrence. Martin Lawrence's monologue on SNL was so bad that a section of it was actually removed from the live broadcast because the network wouldn't let it air. And if you're wondering what kind of stuff is so bad it won't get aired on television, well, his monologue was talking about uh, genital hygiene of intimate areas, specifically of female intimate areas. And the whole thing was just really crass and explicit. When the episode aired later that night for West Coast viewers, NBC cut out the portion of the monologue and replaced it with text explaining the gist of Lawrence's commentary and how, quote, network policy prevents any rebroadcasting of that routine. The rest of the show went on as usual, but Lawrence was obviously banned from the show right after. Halfway number five, Cypress Hill. The group Cypress Hill was known for a lot of things back in the day. One in particular was their love of smoking weed. And apparently even though they were told not to touch the substance the night they were on the show, they of course did. Member DJ Mugg said he quote, felt like he needed to make a statement with his performance and that came in the form of him smoking on live TV. And this was back in 1993 when TV was a whole lot different than it is now. Muggs asked Send Dog to light the joint, but he refused, so Muggs just did it himself. The group claims that the SNL cast came up to them right after and told them how cool they thought the stunt was, but obviously this is live TV people and the network was not happy, resulting in a lifelong ban from the show. And at number four, The Replacements. 
The band The Replacements made fools out of themselves during their performance on SNL, and that was because the band was totally sloshed while performing. Apparently it was a pre-show ritual for them to drink before performing, but SNL has a dry set, so they don't allow alcohol beforehand. Apparently the band got around this by having their sound guy sneak in booze after a pre-show sound check. And by the time they went on, they were hammered. And it was very easy to tell from the footage of the performance. The lead singer wandered away from the mic, the bassist was stumbling, and the guitarist was late to start his solo. So the lead singer actually yelled kind of into the mic, come on effer. <laughs> to cue him, which was picked up by the mic. And just when it couldn't get any worse, one of the guys ripped their pants at the very end with their rear end out for the world to see. The guys even trashed their hotel room after, that was paid for by SNL. So I mean, yeah, obviously they were banned after that. That's like four strikes against them. In at number three, Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa was a special type of musician that often infused humor into his music, which made him a great fit for Saturday Night Live, where he was asked to host and be the musical guest in October of 1978. But his performance was so bad, SNL writer and performer Don Novello called it, quote, one of the worst ever. Apparently the final dress rehearsal before the show went so bad that Zappa tried to change his entire approach to the show, but he didn't tell anyone else. And apparently his strategy was to somewhat make fun of the show itself and made the audience aware when things were scripted, with someone from the cast saying, quote, he read the cue cards like he was reading the cards, like he made a point of it. That was his approach to the humor. No one else in the sketches knew it. SNL producer Lauren Michaels did not like the unapproved take on their material and never let him come back. And at number two, Elvis Costello. Elvis Costello broke one of the major rules of SNL and that is going against Lauren Michaels. And he paid the price by getting banned. A December 1977 episode featured Elvis Costello as the musical guest and he played watching the detectives in his first slot. Then in his second slot, he started playing Less Than Zero, but then decided to change his mind midway through the song. He told the band to stop playing and told the audience, quote, I'm sorry ladies and gentlemen, there's no reason to do this song here. He then decided to play Radio Radio, which is one song he was told not to play because of how critical of mass media the song is. And because he stopped the show and changed the song, he was banned. However, it wasn't lifelong, and Michaels let him back in 1989 and even joked about getting banned on SNL's 25th anniversary show, so it seems like it all ended well. And finally, number one, Andy Kaufman. This is a crazy one, because Andy got himself banned. So the situation here was that he was put on the show back in 1975, and he managed to gain an audience off of the show. So SNL had him back many times over the years, with him appearing 10 times in the late 70s and early 80s. But one of his bits went south when it had lifelong consequences. Basically in one skit, he told an SNL producer to read a statement on air in 1982 explaining that Kaufman's scheduled appearance had been cancelled because quote, Andy Kaufman is not funny anymore. Then the viewers were told to decide Andy's fate, with them able to vote on if he would be banned from the show or not. And sadly for Andy, they voted to ban him for life. The self-imposed ban was never lifted, and he never performed again until he passed away in 1984. Kicking off our list at number 10 is Ashley Simpson. While it's no surprise anymore that singers will lip sync their way through a performance, her lip sync fail was one that has gone down in history. It's hard to forget that performance, which happened on SNL back in 2004. It was that thing that pretty much ended her career. I feel like once people catch you lip syncing, they have a hard time trusting your talent because they don't know what's real and what's not. If you haven't seen it, she was performing her song and the music tracks started playing behind her as she started singing, but the timing was very off. So it revealed that she wasn't actually singing and that she was just mouthing the words to the track behind her. Isn't that great? It was extremely awkward because they actually had to stop and reset the track, but by that point, everyone knew that she was lip syncing. You can tell she didn't know what to do with herself, so she just started doing this really weird, awkward dance, trying to laugh it off, but it just made the whole thing even more awkward. I still get secondhand embarrassment from that. Up next, number nine, we have Adrian Brody. Not everyone has a good hosting experience on the show, and Adrian was so bad that he was banned from the show. After his appearance, back in 2003, he was removed from the list of potential future hosts because he went on stage in blackface. He walked on stage to introduce Sean Paul, the Jamaican reggae musician, and wore fake dreadlocks and talked in a fake Jamaican accent. For obvious reasons, people were offended by his little comedy skit and said it was cultural appropriation. The producer at the time, Lauren Michaels, was not thrilled with this decision either and said he had no idea that he was going to do that. 
It has been said that celebrities who appear on the show will often go unscripted while hosting and it's not always a success. He was banned from hosting ever again and in 2012, another celebrity went on the show to impersonate him. That's when you know you've messed up, when you end up in like an SNL skit of people making fun of you. Cruising into number eight is Martin Lawrence. Back in 1994, people were thrilled to see him on the show and by looking at his resume, he would be the perfect guest. He is known for being an actor and a comedian, so a monologue would be no problem for him and he would guarantee a laugh from the audience, right? Well, not quite. It really just depends on what kind of humor you have. During his opening monologue, he went a little too far with his humor and started using inappropriate language. His jokes began to reference hygiene and the female body parts, private parts, and he used a bunch of curse words and just was basically out of control. Of course, this was not in the original script, but like I said, a lot of people like to improv when they go on the show. He was banned from the show and the good news is the monologue was able to be edited in a way that they could remove most of it so it did not damage the ratings that much. Yeah, probably not a good idea to make like hygiene jokes about female body parts. <laughs> What? Coming up next, number seven is The Replacements. The band was on a rise the year before their SNL performance as they hired a New York management company and started to break out into the mainstream media. They came from the underground scene and cleaning up their image was tough because the guitarist Bob Stinson had some drug and mental health issues and tensions within the band seemed to be driving them apart. They went on SNL as a last minute guest replacing the original act, the Pointer Sisters, who canceled just a few days before. The band and performed one of their songs completely wasted and completely out of tune. So Lauren Michaels banned them from returning to the show. Apparently the band performed well at the early evening pre-taped dress rehearsal, but one of their crew members smuggled alcohol into their dressing room and they spent the last few hours before the real show getting drunk with the guest host, Harry Dean. They were so drunk that on their way to the stage, Bob tripped and fell over his guitar and broke it. Like you can't even fake being sober at that point. Up next, number six is Sinead O'Connor, a talented singer who rose to fame during the 80s and was often known for her controversial views about politics and other personal beliefs. Seeing as she had no problem speaking out about her strong beliefs, it wasn't all that surprising that she got banned from SNL after expressing them during one of her appearances. Many people tuned into SNL for a good laugh, but her performance gave off a very different kind of vibe. She was invited on the show to perform and while she was singing a cover of Bob Marley's War, she took out a picture of Pope John Paul II and started reciting the word evil and then went on to rip it in half and say, fight the real enemy. The audience was left in complete shock and didn't know how to react to such a bizarre performance. She was banned from the show and people talked about her performance for a very long time after that. I mean, we're still talking about it today. Halfway through our list number five is Cypress Hills. The now iconic Californian hip hop group made major headlines in 1993 and that is because they caused quite the controversy during their time on SNL. Marijuana was illegal at the time and DJ Muggs, a member of the group, felt like he needed to make a statement about it during his performance. When appearing on the show, SNL as well as his manager and record label told him that he could not smoke up on air. One of the members later revealed that they all agreed they were not not going to light up anything during their performance. But DJ Muggs rebelled and lit one up on stage, which the audience loved, but the producers did not. SNL immediately banned them from the show and also pulled their episode of ever appearing in reruns later on. Group member Sendog did an interview down the road and said, it would have been cool to do Saturday Night Live again, but me personally, I didn't think it was a great thing to do our first time on SNL, but we paid the price and we moved on. Probably for the best. <laughs> Taking over our number four spot is Andy Kaufman. While most people get banned after their performance in a like private professional setting, that didn't happen to Andy when he got banned from the show. He went on the show in 1983 and the producer at the time, Dick Ebersole, banned him in a more dramatic and personal way. Andy had actually appeared on the show many times during the first season, being a huge contribution to the early days of SNL. But his jokes and acting were always very unpredictable and a lot of the times inappropriate. He was kind 
kind of known for that. But during one episode, the producer had enough and decided to make a show of it by asking the audience whether Andy should stay or leave the show. He literally did it on the spot and put Andy's fate in the hands of the audience. The final tally was 195,000 for removing him from the show and 169,000 for keeping him on. So he was kicked off the show and was not allowed to return. And sadly, he passed away just a year after this happened. Rolling into spot number three is Steven Seagal. One thing that never goes over well in the entertainment industry is showing up to a job with a negative attitude and an ego. When the martial artist slash action movie star went on SNL as a guest host back in 1991, he went into it with a bit of a critical attitude. He struggled to make the sketches work and criticized the rest of the cast and the writing staff, which is highly offensive. And when he tried to rework some of the sketches on his own, they did not quite hit that comedic mark that SNL strives for. One former SNL cast member, Tim Meadows, recalled working with him and said, he just wasn't very funny and he was very critical of the cast and the writing staff. He didn't realize that you can't tell somebody they're stupid on Wednesday and expect them to continue writing for you on Saturday. For that, uh, he was asked to not return to the show. Not surprised. Making her way into number two is Louise Lasser. She was best known for her role in the 1970s soap opera, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. So fans were excited to find out that she'd be hosting SNL, but it seemed like she wasn't as excited as they were. In fact, reports say she had a miserable time hosting and didn't want to do it. Even though she's not the first First one on our list, she was actually the very first person to ever get banned from SNL. So she basically started it all. During her opening monologue, she mentioned that her TV show character, Mary Hartman, was in the middle of having a nervous breakdown. She then started to emulate her character and started rambling about how scared she was to be on live television. At first, people thought she was just acting and like playing up this character, but then she ran off stage and locked herself in her dress dressing room, like mid-performance. Other cast members tried to coax her out of the room, but only Chevy Chase was successful. But even after the show continued on, she kept forgetting her lines and the episode ended with her sitting on the studio floor talking about her personal problems. She was banned from the show, but in 2013, she did an interview and said she intentionally made it look like she was having a breakdown because she didn't want to perform the sketches that they had written for her. So it was kind of like a planned out tantrum on stage as a way to prove a point. Last but not least in our number one spot is Kanye West. He has appeared as a musical guest on the show more than seven times and always gave killer performances that the fans expected. But one performance was not like the rest. <laughs> During an episode in 2018, he brought his own set pieces, light shows, special effects, and even costumes. He and Lil Pump performed a song and they did it while wearing huge movement restricting water bottle costumes. Was it weird? Yes, but since Kanye was held in such high regard with SNL, they allowed him a third performance in that episode. Rather than just playing a song, he delivered a speech in praise of former president Donald Trump while wearing one of his Make America Great Again hats. Not what he was invited on the show to do. NBC actually cut the speech short for viewers and even when SNL's 90 minute time slot ran out, Kanye just continued to walk around the stage dismissing allegations of racism that were shot at Trump and and criticize the mainstream media. Reports say he was banned from returning to the show, even though Kanye insisted on Twitter that he was asked to host the show. We're not really sure, but I have a feeling he got in some trouble for that. At number five, Carmen. For so many up and coming performers, you want to get yourself out in front of as many people as possible. Fame, after all, is based on talent and fan base, so if you can get as many people as possible engaging with your content, then you're golden. For many people, SNL can be a quick way to get to the top, but for others, it can ruin your career even before they really got it started. This is sort of what happened with music duo Carmen in February of 2012. SNL can be a testing ground for a lot of new artists as new audiences are able to get a feel for this new talent. In January 2012, Lana Del Rey made her debut and though she had some negative reviews, particularly those saying that she looked lost and distanced on stage, she was able to then turn these reviews into the image that she holds today with her almost ethereal performances. But just a month later, when Carmen took the stage, their performance wasn't strong enough to catapult their career like it did for Lana. Carmen, though now disbanded and rebranded, was a music duo that got their start 
on YouTube by posting covers. Eventually, they got a large following by posting renditions of songs like Party Rock Anthem and Super Bass. And they were able to release original songs with the help of their newly signed music label. The casting director over at SNL found them and invited them to perform on the show, and so they did. They performed their songs Broken Hearted and I Told You So, and after their performance, the reviews came pouring in and it wasn't good. They faced a lot of criticism saying that they failed to connect with the audience, and one critic saying that their performance caused, quote, mild auditory distress. They were never really able to bounce back from this catastrophe of a performance, and so they eventually faded away, ending their careers. At number four, Charles Rocket. There was a time when SNL was in big trouble. From 1980 to 1981, SNL was facing a bout of struggle and negativity following a controversial position change as they promoted Gene Dumanian to executive producer after Lauren Michaels took a break from the show. Because of this position change, most of the cast left, prompting Gene to have to hire a new cast. This new cast was untested, and so the 80-81 season was really just in the dirt. One incident made things worse for everyone, and that was when comedian Charles Rocket dropped an F-bomb during a skit. Though SNL skits can be controversial, one thing that is absolutely a no-go are those pesky F-bombs, and so dropping one can be very bad for you and the studio. During the season's 11th episode, Charles was closing out the show and for whatever reason decided to let an F-bomb fly. While doing his closing, Charles, in reference to a skit that he did earlier in the show, said, quote, It's the first time I've been shot in my life. I'd like to know who the F did it, end quote. If you watch this footage back, you can tell that this wasn't an accidental slip up on Charles' part and that he actually meant to say it. This was the last straw for the studio and they fired much of the cast and crew, including Gene and Charles. This whole F word scandal came so close to sinking the entire show for good, but it sure did sink a lot of people's careers. If you're enjoying the video so far, please consider leaving a like to help support the channel. And also, if you're in the mood, check out my gaming channel for some extra content with me. I promise it's fun. At number three, Jenny Slate. Sometimes it takes a mistake to realize that you just aren't cut out for something. Mistakes are good for teaching us things, even though they totally suck in the moment. This was pretty much the case with comedian Jenny Slate during her brief time on SNL. Though she's pretty successful now, back in 2009 when she worked on SNL, she was still up and coming, looking to get her foot in the door. Things were starting to look up for Jenny when she landed the coveted role on SNL as a writer and performer, but things quickly took a nosedive as she messed up pretty big during her very first performance. In her first appearance as a member of the cast on the show, she was performing one of the sketches that she wrote called Biker Chick Chat. And in one of her lines, she accidentally switched up her words from being PG-13 to being a little more adult. Jenny ended up committing one of the greatest SNL sins, saying the F word. She caught herself saying it, but just brushed it off, pretending like no one else heard it, but unfortunately, people did hear it. This mistake sort of stuck with her while she was working there, and though she wasn't fired for that specific reason, she did end up leaving at the end of that season. Though there was a misconception that the F-bomb was what ended her SNL career, Jenny said in an interview that, quote, that's not why I got fired. I just didn't belong there. I didn't do a good job. I didn't click. I have no idea how Lauren felt about me. All I know is it didn't work for me, and I got fired, end quote. Her career eventually picked up, but it probably set her back a bit after being fired from SNL. At number two, Ashley Simpson. Now, I know we talked about one music act who destroyed their career on SNL, but here's another one for you that you might be more familiar with. After this performance, her career was never the same. Ashley Simpson was getting her music career off the ground in the early 2000s, and in 2004, she was invited to perform a couple of songs on SNL. Like I said before, this kind of opportunity can be a big deal for some, but for others, it can be detrimental. Anything can happen during a a live performance and it could be good or catastrophic. Well, Ashley accepted the invitation to perform and geared up to perform her song's autobiography and Pieces of Me. The performance of Pieces of Me went off without a hitch. Actually, it was pretty successful and got her and the audience pumped for another song, but this is where things turned sour. As the band got ready to start playing autobiography, a track started playing and it wasn't what people were expecting to hear. Instead of hearing an instrumental for the correct song, they were instead listening to a pre-recorded vocal track of Ashley singing Pieces of Me. This accidental slip up revealed to everyone that she had been lip syncing the entire time. Ashley froze for a second and then started doing a weird and very awkward dance before rushing off the stage. It was mortifying and very detrimental to her career and this incident stuck with her for a year. Later on down the line, Ashley spoke out about that incident saying that it was partially her dad's fault that this happened, saying that he suggested that she make a backup track because she was having troubles with her voice and didn't want to have her strain it more. Now Ashley looks back on this incident saying that it certainly sucked, but she's stronger for it. And that's a positive way to look at things. Way to go, Ashley. And finally, at number one, Sinead O'Connor.
O'Connor. Probably one of the biggest SNL controversies to date comes from the drama surrounding Sinead O'Connor, the Catholic Church, and SNL. The show has had its fair share of controversies and scandals in the past, but I think few of them come close to this one that happened on October 3rd, 1992. On this episode, Sinead was asked to perform a few songs from her newest album at the time, and she agreed, but there was a little fine print to accompany her appearance. She refused to perform one of her original songs. Instead, Sinead opted to sing Bob Marley's song, War. The show's executives thought this was a bit of a bizarre request, but they went along with it anyway because they thought that no matter what she sang, it would still be a captivating performance. Well, it was captivating, all right, but not for the reasons that anyone was expecting. That night during her performance, Sinead did a very dramatic rendition of the song, even switching up some of the lyrics to change the context and meaning. It was all starting to get a little tense until Sinead blew the doors off the performance by ending it with her ripping up a photo of Pope John Paul II, saying, quote, fight the real enemy. She did all of this as a means to raise awareness about the alleged going on in the Catholic Church because she had personal experience with those who were allegedly hurt by members of the church and she wanted to fight against it. This stunt prompted a lot of anger towards Sinead as well as the show. For days following her performance, NBC received thousands of angry calls condemning them for allowing something like this to happen. Other celebrities like Madonna and Joe Pesci also had some harsh words for Sinead and this stunt ruined her career after this as no one was quick to forget this scandal. Oh, 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 oh,